The first step in restoring the 1953 CJ3B is rebuilding the rear axle and installing a lock right locker. But first, we need to go through and clean it up. So now that we have the center section all stripped down, I will go through and wash it. And to do that, I just have a bucket with a little bit of diesel in it, wire brush, some scotch Bright pad, uh, clean it all up. And we'll do the same thing to the housing here behind me as well. Once we get it all cleaned up, then we'll go through and install this lock right locker. So we have the carrier all cleaned up. It's time to go through and install this lock right locker. Uh, now with this locker, it essentially just replaces the spider gears inside of the existing carrier. A couple advantages to that. One, obviously less parts, less material that you're buying, so it keeps the cost down. But the other thing is if you weren't going through a full rebuild like we are, you wouldn't need to worry about trying to reset ring and pinion backlash or anything like that because the carrier stays the same, so all of those dimensions will stay the same. Uh, the one drawback to this style of locker, they say, is strength, because now you're relying on the factory carrier uh, strength. But the motor only puts out double-digit horsepower and torque numbers, so I'm not worried about uh, the strength of this unit. It's all, everything's staying factory, it's just the locker is being installed. Alright, so we got the locker installed. Real time it only took about 20 minutes, so not that bad. So next steps, we're going to go through, measure up what these old shims were, find new shims that match, and then we'll press the bearings on, rebolt the ring gear, and then clean up the pinion. Uh, and then we'll talk about ring and pinion setup uh, before we actually get it installed. Alright, so we have the axle housing all cleaned up, we've got the ring gear torqued in, and before we go through and install this, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, ring and pinion setup in general, so we'll bounce back and forth between here at the bench and the install. Now there's three main measurements when setting up a ring and pinion. The first one being a pinion depth, which is how far the pinion will sit into the housing, and what that does sets how close or far away the pinion is from 
the ring gear, or essentially the face of the pinion to the center line of the axle or center line of the ring gear. Uh, and how that is adjusted is with a set of shims. Now on this axle, they go behind the race. Sometimes they'll go in front of the bearing or between the, the pinion gear and the bearing. Now every pinion has a measurement or marking on it. So you can go through, they make tools to measure. You set it in and you can measure from center line essentially to that pinion face. Now I don't have one of those tools, so we'll talk a little bit later about how I'm gonna determine is my pinion depth correct. Like I mentioned before, we'll just use the original shim, so we should be in pretty close shape. Next measurement is same with the pinion, and that's pinion bearing preload. And what that is, is obviously with the bearings and the way the pinion is set up that we torque the yoke and nut down, you can apply too much torque to the bearing to where it won't spin, or that it's very difficult to spin. And so if there's too much preload on the bearing, obviously it'll just cause excessive wear, maybe heat, and really just, just smoke the bearings out. And if there's not enough, then that could cause play, sort of same thing, but on a different way of wearing the bearings out too quickly, or allowing the pinion to actually move during operation. So there's two ways pinion bearing preload is set. Uh, in this case, it's with shims. Sometimes it's with a crush sleeve. So the shims will go on. Uh, same thing, we're using the factory setup. So with the factory shims, we should be in the ballpark for pinion bearing preload. When tightening the pinion nut, I stop to spin the pinion to make sure there's no binding. To fully seat the bearings, I strike each side of the pinion and then continue torquing. To check the bearing preload, I'm using an inch pound dial. I'm looking for a reading between 14 and 19 inch pounds. All right, so the third measurement we're gonna talk about is backlash, and we'll look at the ring gear for that. Now we went through earlier, we put shims in between the carrier and the bearings. So what those shim packs do is move the ring gear side to side within the carrier. So the, obviously with the pinion, it comes in, we set how deep it is, but with the ring gear, we set how close essentially to the side to side the ring gear is to the pinion. And so with measuring backlash or what backlash is, is the amount of play between when the pinion gear hits one side of the ring gear tooth to the other side. So this sort of exaggeration of the screwdriver being in here from one side of the tooth to the other side, is essentially what we're gonna measure uh, for backlash. So we have the pinion and carrier installed. Even though the pinion bearing preload's a little light, um, I wanted to get the carrier installed to see how the pattern is to see how the pinion depth is. Uh, if I needed to adjust the pinion depth, I would need to redo pinion bearing preload anyway, so I just wanted to, to check the depth first before setting preload. Uh, so now that we have the carrier installed, what we're gonna do is go through and set backlash, which again is measuring how far the ring gear is Side to side, is it close enough to the pinion? And now, if I move the ring gear slightly, you hear that ticking back and forth, and that's the, the ring gear making contact with the pinion. So that little bit of play is what we're gonna measure with backlash. So I'll set up the dial indicator, go through, move the ring gear again, and see what that measurement is between when it hits one side to when it hits the other side. All right, so we have the dial indicator set up. We have a magnetic base to the axle housing, uh, and the dial is right at the end of one tooth. Uh, now, I like to set my dial indicator with some sort of a preload, just to make sure that I'm not, when I move the ring gear one way, that I'm not coming off of the dial indicator and getting a false reading. So now I'm just gonna move the ring gear from one side to the other, and we see that movement, and that's what we wanna measure. So it looks like 
go from about 19 to 27 thousandths. So that's a difference of about 8 thousandths. Now with this stain of 44, we're allowed somewhere between six and 10 thousandths is the tolerance. So we're right in the middle. Uh, so I'm happy with how this is set up right now. Uh, and I'd be confident running this. All right, so now we're gonna go through and paint the ring gear. Uh, and with this, we're checking the pattern. So we're checking the backlash. We had the pinion locked so that it was not spinning. Uh, so we've taken that wrench off to allow the pinion to spin because obviously as we spin the ring gear, the pinion needs to spin with it. Now we're gonna mark about three teeth and a couple spots uh, just to get a good, good reading. Now this is uh, paint especially designed for this. So I've mixed it with just a little bit of gear oil and we should be able to get a good reading. And then once it's marked, we want to spin the ring gear, make sure we spin the ring gear and not the pinion in order to track the pattern properly. All right, so now that we've spun the ring gear around, it's time to read the pattern. And what we're actually looking for is where the paint has been wiped away from where we painted these three or four gears. And so if looking on this side, this is the coast side of the gear. The concave side is the coast side of the gear. We're looking at where the paint has been wiped away. And we're looking at that marking in relation to the inside, to the outside of the gear, as well as the tip to the base of the tooth itself. And as you can see, there's a pretty good pattern, uh, pretty good depth, and it's mostly uh, in the center of that tooth uh, is where that has been wiped away. So now if we spin this and look at the drive side, so same thing, we see the pattern here. Uh, good engagement from the tip to the base, but on this side, it's a little bit closer to the inside of the tooth than the outside of the tooth. So the question is, is this a good pattern? So let's take a look at some uh, pictures of what acceptable patterns are and what they are not. All right, so I have a Yukon uh, installation booklet that I got when I put the gears in the CJ7. So now this has examples of what a acceptable pattern is, what the pattern is if the pinion is too close, and what the pattern is if the pinion is too far away. So now, as we looked at ours, the coast marking was essentially in the center of the gear, and the drive was a little bit closer to the inside. So something like this. But where it becomes very subjective is this picture looks an awful lot like this picture where same thing, the drive is on that, that inner lower side and the coast is somewhat in the middle. I don't have enough experience to tell you the difference between these two, uh, but considering that it's a factory setup, we use the factory shims, I'm gonna say that this pattern is okay and acceptable and I'm going to run it. Uh, and that's where it becomes very tricky to tell exactly what the pattern is saying and, and if you, should feel comfortable in running it or not. So now that I'm okay with this pattern, I'm gonna go through, pull the carrier out, pull the pinion out to add or take out a couple shims to increase the pinion bearing preload. Once I get that where I want it, I'll throw the center section back in, just double check the backlash quick, and then we should be all set to wrap this up.
All right, so we got the carrier installed, everything torqued back down. I did double check the backlash and everything's good there. We're still at the 8,000s. Now I need to go through and either try and find or buy a pinion seal for it, but I can put that in after. So the next step with this rear axle is gonna be going through installing the axle shafts and wheel bearings. Uh, but on this, it's a bit different. It's a two piece axle shaft and you actually have to shim the wheel bearing. So I'm gonna save that for the next video. This video is getting a little long already. Now, if you have any questions about the ring and pinion setup, any of the tools I use today, uh, just drop them in the comments below. When I go through with the front axle and do the ring and pinion, I can answer them then. Otherwise, I'll just skim along that. But for now, I have to get back to work on the Jeep. Thanks, bye.